All right, Brother Micah has introduced the book of James to us, previous, and uh, he's going to be getting into more of the text tonight. It's one of those books that's a standalone book. We've got Peter's books and John's books and Paul's books, but he's one of those that's by itself, just James. So it's always been interesting in that way and very different in, in various aspects of it. So looking forward to it, Brother Micah. All right, we'll be in the book of James, as Pastor Little said, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Last time together, we considered verses 2 through 4, considering it all joy when you meet various trials. We'll continue on with verses 5 through 9 this afternoon. So James chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, let's hear the word of the Lord. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, Lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we again ask your blessing on this time together in which we have gathered to open your word, to uh, consider what you would teach us, to sing praises to your name, to praise you and beseech you in prayer. We are grateful for this day in which you have given us to worship you, to fellowship with your people around your word in the name of your Son. We pray that you would bless this time as you have blessed earlier this morning. We pray that you, your word would Go forth with great power over the earth as it is preached uh, this day, the, the world over. Pray that you would uh, lead us and guide us in right paths, that we would uh, seek you in, in all things and, and thereby bring honor and glory to your name. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So yes, as we uh, have looked at James, we've, we've come to see that James is a very practical book. There's not a lot of deep doctrinal discussions. It's very focused on uh, practical Christian living. Uh, the first practical exhortation that James gave to the dispersed Christians that we considered last week was to count it all joy when things don't go as planned, when we meet trials of various kinds. It is to be counted as joy because we know that God's plan is unfolding and it is superior, a superior plan to our own. And we can and should have joy and not despair when God's will is done. The will of God as it unfolds should make us steadfast in our faith. As we pray, thy will be done. That's what we're taught to pray. Thy will be done, not my own. It is the joy of the Christian for God to have his way with us. We want God to... Uh, mold us and, and shape us into what He would have us to be. And God's way for His people is that they grow and mature in their faith, that they move from the milk to the meat, that they grow in conformity in Christ's likeness. What is the will of God for me is a very common question that Christians uh, ask. We, we pray for this daily, wanting to know the will of God. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to be while I do it? Who do you want me to do it with? For how long before I do something else? We ask these kinds of questions all the time. Well, we know one thing that is the will of God, that we grow in our faith to maturity. If I'm going to grow in faith through trials, I'm going to need wisdom to know how to respond to the trials that come. 
we remarked last time, there, of all the trials that all the people in this room are going to face, there's no way I can give you a specific answer to each one. But we know who can, the Lord. And so this is where James takes us next in his short epistle. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he begins. And James connects two universals of the church with the thought of lack. There's a lack here. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, is how he closed verse 4. The first universal is that Christians in the church are all going to go through trials. There's not a one of us that hasn't gone through trials. And the, the saying it goes that either you are in the midst of a trial, or you're fresh out of a trial, or you're about to go into a trial. You're in one of three stages. We're all going to face trials in our lives. And so the, the first universal, Christians go through trials. And as Christians, trials have a purpose for us. They make us steadfast in our faith. That is their divinely appointed end. The second universal is this lack of wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, does anybody want to say here today that they don't lack wisdom? Yeah, that's what I thought. I read a verse like this and I go, ooh, this is for me. I definitely lack wisdom. Let's see what James has to say. So here we want to ask the question, now what, what is wisdom? What is wisdom? The Greek word, of course, is sophia, spelled uh, S-O-P-H-I-A in the transliteration, which we derive the feminine name, Sophia or Sophie. Uh, Danker and Bauer's Greek lexicon defines Sophia as the capacity to understand and function accordingly. Webster's 1828 Classic Dictionary defines wisdom as the right use of exercise, I'm sorry, the right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends, and the best means to accomplish them. Most uh, commentators would say wisdom is more than just collection of facts and data. It is uh, the practical approach of knowledge, or I'm sorry, the practical application of knowledge to God-honoring ends. That is wisdom. The practical application of knowledge to God-honoring ends. When we say so-and-so is very wise. They're a very wise person. What do we mean when we say that? Well, we mean that they know how to think and act in situations in ways that glorify God. That's what makes them wise. They know the proper way to respond. They know the proper way to respond. Because of this lack of wisdom on our part about certain things, we seek older, more mature Christians to help us think and act in a wise way in certain situations. That's why we're placed in the context of a church. We're all in various life stages, have had various experiences, and we're to share with each other what we've learned that we can grow together, bear each other's burdens, lift one another up in prayer. Most of the Proverbs were written by the wisest man who ever lived. He wrote them instructing his son how to walk uprightly before God in a myriad of day-to-day -day situations. Lots of people read the Proverbs for their daily devotionals. They're good for that. Of course, Solomon's son Rehoboam didn't have the Spirit of God in him, so he wasn't wise and didn't heed his father's wise counsel. And the nation of Israel suffered from that for a very long time. It is possible, we would say, to be knowledgeable without the Holy Spirit, but it's impossible to be wise without Him. You can have knowledge, you can collect data and facts, but you're not going to live in a way that glorifies God. You're not going to have biblical wisdom apart from the Spirit of God. The natural man's eyes are closed to the things of the Lord, Scriptures tell us. Psalm 111 verse 10 and Proverbs 9 verse 10 have the same phrase. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's no arriving at wisdom without fearing the Lord. If you don't start with the Lord, you certainly won't end with wisdom. You will not be able to use your accumulation of knowledge rightly, that is, to the glory of God, which is, of course, the right use of everything. It was all created to be used for His glory. And so this is what gives James, this is what gives James' statement, if any of you lacks wisdom, 
such universal appeal. None of us would dare claim that we have done knock the glass over, that we have done everything we have done with perfect wisdom of the situation and all possible factors and outcomes and have done all things always and only to the glory of God. We lack wisdom. We don't know how to respond. If any of you lacks wisdom. Last time together, of course, I mentioned there was no way for me to tell you how to respond in a God-honoring way to every specific trial that will befall you. Impossible. I can't know the future, and I certainly don't have exhaustive knowledge of every possible trial God can send down to, to us. But you know who can and will help you respond in a God-honoring way to every trial you encounter? Well, the God who sends the trials, of course. We should be crying out to Him in the midst of trials. That's what James is going to hit at. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. If we don't lack trials, we shouldn't lack prayers. We should pray our way through trials, brothers and sisters. God has given us several ways by which we grow in and attain wisdom. And as we, we pray for divine wisdom, as we ask God, there are ways we can know if we're act, asking in faith. We don't want to just sit around in our house and ask God and then never make use of means that He's given us. There are means that God has given us, and we can know we're asking in faith if we're using His means. First, do we actively search the revealed mind of God for wisdom on how to act in the different situations and trials that He brings to us? We want to know if the answer to our prayer is already on the pages of our Bible, because oftentimes it is. It's there for us to find if we'll only crack the Bible open and find it. We shouldn't ask or expect God to give us in a second what we don't want to spend more time than that looking for. It's not asking in faith if we go, okay, God, I'm just going to sit here and wait for you to give it. You know, that's faith, right? Just sitting around and waiting. No. Use the Bible. Use the means. Ask God to give you wisdom as you search His revealed mind. Second, when we ask God for wisdom, we cannot expect to know His decree of will before it happens. God's not going to tell you the future beyond the book of Revelation, which is subject to a number of interpretations. God's not going to give you any future and tell you exactly who you should marry, exactly where you should live. But what has He done? He's given us principles by which we can know and deduce, well, maybe this is a good candidate for marriage and maybe this person isn't. We have these, we have these principles that we can, we can follow. That is His preceptive will that He has given to us. This is the will of God, your sanctification, you abstain from fornication. That's the will of God. That's His preceptive will. His decretive will is whatever He does from His sovereign throne. All of history as it unfolds. And we, brothers and sisters, we are growing in our faith when we understand wisdom to be less about trying to know beforehand what God is going to do and more about knowing beforehand what you ought to do. We want to know what we ought to do. God's going to take care of the future. Leave that with Him. He's not going to reveal it to you. You've got the book of Revelation if you want to re research the future. We need to be concerned about what we ought to do. Our end of it. Thirdly, when we ask God for wisdom, we need to be careful not to equate divine wisdom as we pray and ask, search His Word, we don't want to equate divine wisdom with a gut feeling or maybe a fleece being wet or dry. That was fine for Gideon. God's not going to give you a wet or dry fleece as in an answer. Uh, Christ has become to us wisdom from God. Christ is the wisdom and power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 24 and 30. We don't need to look for divine confirmatory signs outside of the Word such as a fleece. Well, Lord, if it's this, make it appear this way. If it's that, make it appear that way. We don't put God to the test in that way. Now, of course, I'm not saying that God doesn't open doors, and we can't open doors in italics, and we can't uh, know, or in quotation marks, and we can't know His will by analyzing circumstances according to His Word. That's exactly what you should do. And God will open doors. He'll make the way plain. Plainer at some times than others, but that's how He leads us Along, But we must be careful, brothers and sisters, not to put God to the test by demanding 
a sign. You need to be careful, too, for looking inward for wisdom. In, in the futility of our minds, we walk around in darkness. We need wisdom from above to break into that darkness. So we want to be careful of gut feelings. Well, this is, I just felt like this is what I needed to do. We look outward to Christ, not inward. Christ who is the wisdom of God. And as Colossians 2.3 says, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom or knowledge. That's exactly where we should be looking. At Him, not at us. Christ. Again, I'm not saying we should ignore our conscience. Never do that. Or forego reasoning in our mind. God gave us brains for a reason. If only some people would use them, save a lot of trouble in this world. But we must be careful that the voice of God's word is not contradicted by our inward desires. And while you're asking God for wisdom, let him ask God, avail yourself of all the resources of the bride of Christ. Many times people sit in their home and they pray and they don't open their Bible. They, they, they're looking for gut feelings and, and dry or wet fleeces. Um, they want to know the future, what they ought to do. We need to avail ourselves of the resources in the bride of Christ. Go to church. Hear the Word of God preached. Have your questions answered. You should come to the church with questions about the Bible, questions about God. You should know where your pastor's preaching through. Have questions about the text. Ask him. Ask the elders in the church. Ask your brothers and sisters. We're all learning this stuff together, growing in grace. So avail yourself of all the resources of the Bride of Christ. A massive conduit. The biggest conduit of wisdom flows from heaven to earth through the church. If you're not plugged into one, be plugged into one. You need a local church. I can tell that to anybody without uh, hesitation. You need to be in a local church. Find a church where the word of God is faithfully preached and the true God is worshipped, idols are crushed, and be disciplined to attend to the preaching, to the fellowship of the saints, and to communal praying with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Ask collectively for wisdom. You might be uh, saying to me now, well, you know, Mike, let him ask God. James didn't tell us to do all these things. Well, that's right. He didn't. But elsewhere in his word, God has told us to do these things, and they are his means for us to grow in wisdom and in true spirituality. What I'm saying is don't take James' words and just say, well, if I ask God, that foregoes all use of means. I don't have to apply any means in my pursuit of wisdom. No, you should be asking God for wisdom and blessing the means that you're using. But the capstone of all of these these, uh, exhortations is the one that James gives. Let him ask God. If, If we can go about and do all the things we want to do, but if God's blessing is not on it, it's all fruitless. It doesn't mean anything. We need the blessing of God. Our Heavenly Father, of course, is the the source of all wisdom. We sang hymns uh, relating to that. God only wise. He is the source of all wisdom. Wisdom is His revealed mind to His creatures. Our Heavenly Father is the source of all wisdom. Wisdom, of course, we would say, is doing things according to His mind. So we, His children, should avail ourselves of the divine mind, like a son or daughter that always asks why. Have you ever had one of those? Daddy, why? Mommy, why? 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 You know, we should be like that with our Heavenly Father. It's not going to annoy Him. We need to know why. Let us ask in faith. If we're making diligent use of these resources, then we may pray with faith that God will give us the wisdom that we seek. Sometimes it's through these means that God is going to supply the answer to our inquisition. If we're devouring His Word talking with Him constantly, loving His bride, how can we fail to grow in wisdom? If we're not doing these things out of just habit, empty formalism. But if we're truly loving the Lord with all our heart, making use of the means, asking His blessing on all things, Lord, give me wisdom as I read Your Word, as I commune with Your people. How can we fail to grow in wisdom? When we ask God for wisdom, how much we want it will be reflected in our pursuit of it. Yes, that's what I'm driving at. That's what it means to ask in faith. But let us not forget James' simple yet crucial command. Ask God. Never try to pursue wisdom apart from asking God. Because God, we want to be our teacher. 
Wisdom is, is his mind revealed. The Greek verb for ask here in verse 5 is another one of James's imperatives, his little book loaded with commands in the Greeks. In the Greek, ask God. We need to ask God's blessing on all our endeavors, most definitely endeavoring to know how he would have us live in the midst of trials. Lord, how do I respond in this trial, to this trial, in a way that brings honor and glory to you? The command of James, let him ask God, is supplied with all the necessary impulse. If we keep reading in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And then he goes on to talk about God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives. If James had stopped there, that would be enough for us. But he didn't just say God gives it. He goes on to add a whole list of uh, qualifiers here. He gives to all generously. He goes far beyond that. The Greek adverb for generously here is haplos. It appears only here in the New Testament. One thing we lack universally, wisdom, is one thing God is said to give generously, universally, to all. He gives this generally, or generously, and He gives it who? To all. Nobody can exclude themselves and say, well, because I'm, I'm this, I can't receive the wisdom of God, because I'm of this ethnicity, or I'm born in this nation, or I'm a man or a woman, it, uh, I'm excluded. He gives generously to all. Who's going to put themselves outside of that? We all need wisdom. And he gives it to all. This is a comforting thought. Anyone that lacks wisdom and knows they lack it is in a better state than one who lacks wisdom and is blind to their lack. To the one humble enough to acknowledge his or her need, there's a generous supply for that need in God. He gives generously wisdom, this precious thing that we need. He gives it to all. And then just when you think it couldn't get any better, James says it is given without reproach. Without reproach. Sometimes the the child constantly asking their father or mother why, sometimes they get a reproach. They get tired of the the constant nagging. Sometimes it comes from a child that they just like saying the word. They like the sound of their voice saying why. Sometimes it comes from a generally inquisitive child or or a, a genuinely inquisitive child. But God gives wisdom to all generously and without reproach. The Greek word here for reproach means to demean, to mock, or to heap insults. Have you ever asked someone a question only to have them demean, mock you, or heap insults on you? Yeah, probably so. I'm going to go with probably. Probably multiple times. You went to somebody genuinely desiring to know, not a nagging, why child, and that you asked a question... And all they could do was heap an insult. You idiot, you don't know this. What's wrong with you? So, this is not like God. God gives without reproach. If we go to somebody and and all they have is an answer to the question in the package of insults and mocking, I don't want their answer, frankly. I don't have time to... Sit and listen to uh, mockings and insultings. We all know things that each other doesn't know. Everybody in this room. You all can tell me things I don't know. I probably have something that you don't too. So that's why we're supposed to work together to grow. And not to insult one another just because we don't uh, know something. That, is, that would be uh, following after the manner of our Heavenly Father who gives without reproach. God is not some stingy, grumpy father who's always reluctant when his creatures want to be wise in the manner of their heavenly Father. God wants his image restored in us. One way we reflect the image of God is to be wise. The problem is not God's supposed reluctance. It's not that he's only got a little bit of wisdom and he can only give us a little sprinkle of it. No, he gives it generously. And he gives it to all and it's without reproach. The problem is not with God's reluctance to give wisdom. The the problem is that, as James is going to say later, we have not because we ask not. Because we're not in the business of asking for wisdom, ascertaining our need for wisdom, and then going before God and saying, Lord, I need wisdom in this trial. I need to know how to act that I bring honor and glory to your name in the midst of this and don't shame you because things aren't going according to my plan. 
A.T. Robertson had a, a great remark on this without reproach. He says, instead of upbraiding us for asking, the rather we are made to wonder why we did not ask sooner. God does not chide us for our folly, but gives us good measure of wisdom to take its place. What a gracious Heavenly Father we have. He doesn't chide us for not knowing. Slap us across the head. You imbecile child, why did you not know? So, God, He gives generously precious wisdom to all without reproach. And it will be given to Him. Brothers and sisters, what more can He say than to you He hath said? Are we asking for wisdom? What we got to come away from? It will be given, says James. It's there for the taking. If we will go and bow before the Lord and ask Him for wisdom. Verse 6, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. We could ask, of course, what, what reason do we have to doubt the Lord? Has He not always proven Himself faithful? We don't serve a faithless, covenant-forsaking, covenant-breaking God. We have a faithful God. What, what, God is it, what good is it to claim that belief in God is good? What good is it to claim that God is good, that He is able to supply this lack, and then in our prayers we, we completely abandon that belief? Oh, he's not really going to give it. We lack faith. We doubt His ability. We doubt His provision. We doubt His resources. Or we can abandon Him to the point we don't pray at all. Well, I, I keep praying for wisdom and I don't get it yet. Well, you know, Jesus told a parable about somebody that kept knocking. So if you don't have it yet, keep knocking. Keep asking. Ask and it will be given to you. James says it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith. To doubt the goodness of God and his faithful provision of all things needful for this life is to dishonor him. We dishonor him if we... Um, Ask Him, but don't believe that He's going to give it. That, that's not honoring to God. We don't need to merely pray for the right things. We need to pray for the right things from a right heart. Let Him ask in faith with no doubting. A right heart before God. When it comes to our prayers for wisdom, faith the size of a mustard seed is worth infinitely more than a sea of vacillation and uncertainty. Maybe he'll give it, maybe he won't. Maybe he'll give me what I don't want. That's not worth anything. We need faith the size of mustard seed. The one thing Jesus said is said to have marveled at is the great faith of the centurion in Luke 7, 9. I found Jesus marveled. I have not found faith so great, not in all of Israel. And yet, what did Jesus rebuke his disciples for? What was their lack of faith? Mark 4.40. That was what got the rebuke of Jesus. Their lack of faith. So the question we should ask ourselves is, would Jesus marvel at the faith of your prayers? Or would he rebuke your lack of faith when you petition the high king of heaven and earth? Is there faith in your prayers? Are they from a right heart, a believing heart? Let him ask in faith with no doubting, says James. We could ask the question, do we trust human sinners more than we trust God? We ask them to do things. Parents ask their children to do things. Employers ask their employees to do things. Husbands and wives ask each other to do things. And we expect them to be done. How dare we ask God for wisdom and expect Him to not give it? How dare we have more confidence in sinners than in God? Let Him ask in faith with no doubting. God forgive us for putting more confidence in man than in Himself. We are trusting Him for the salvation of our souls, are we not? We are trusting Him to save us from eternal torment, from His wrath. Can we not trust Him to give us wisdom? We can trust Him for everything else besides. Romans 8.32 He, that is God, who did not spare His own Son, Jesus, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? It's a rhetorical question. 
God's going to supply what you need. He took care. How do you know that? Because He took care of your greatest need. The salvation of your soul, which you were helpless to do anything about. Till sovereign grace broke in and regenerated you. You couldn't do anything about it. God is going to supply everything else we need. All we need to do is ask and believe that He'll give it. That's what He's left for us. Ask believing. You're going before a king. The high king of heaven and earth. Are you asking Him at anything at all? And let us ask believing. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts, James goes on in verse 6, is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Restless, aimless, oscillating. The Christian is not to be as the, the sea. The sea in the Old Testament and the New is a picture of restlessness restlessness. Jude uses this very analogy. Jude, the other uh, half-brother of Jesus that, that wrote a book, Jude uses this analogy of the sea to refer to false teachers. So Hebrews, James, First, and 2 Peter, Jude, Jude verse 13, Jude writes, actually 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, forgot about John's little books. Then Jude before Revelation Jude 13 says, actually, let's, let's back up at uh, let's back up to verse 12. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. You think Jude had any warm, warm, fuzzy feelings for false teachers? Doesn't sound like it. They're foaming up their own shame. The, the Christian, on the, to the contrary, is to be grounded. Not to be restless, aimless, back and forth, driven and tossed. The Christian is to be grounded, built upon the rock of Christ Jesus immovable from the revealed wisdom in Christ Jesus. That's where we stand. We're not aimless. We're not, well, this may be right, that may be right. God is right, every man a liar. And we're not to move from that. Churning uncertainty and foaming indecision are not Christian characteristics. We don't have to wonder and be uncertain. We have the mind of God. Why do we need to go out to the world and, and, and do polls to find things out about well, what, 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 what is right, what is wrong, as if we're trusting in the, the masses? We have the mind of God. We don't need man's mind. We have the mind of God. Jesus is the anchor of our soul. We're not restless. We're not aimless. Author of Hebrews, Jesus is the anchor of your soul. He, Hebrews 6.19 We are built up in Christ, writes uh, Paul in Ephesians 4.14, we are built up in Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine. Brothers and sisters, it, there's an ocean out there of uncertainty and bad theology, bad doctrine, worldly ideas that's going to take you and toss you to and fro. And it's not going to be a pleasant ride. We are built in Christ, built upon Christ, grounded upon the rock. All else is sinking sand. Let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Exactly where you don't want to be. Verse 7, James writes, For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If you doubt the ability and goodness of God to grant you wisdom that you're asking Him for, your lack of faith is an instability. It warrants no answer from God. Robert Johnston writes in his commentary on James, a wavering or doubting suppliant exhibits a worthless, aimless instability of character. God is good, brothers and sisters. Are you asking accordingly? Are you asking at all? But if you're not sure if He will do you good... Don't be surprised when you didn't really expect God to deliver and He didn't. You can't blame God with that. Are you asking with faith? Do you really want wisdom? 
The author of Hebrews again writes in Hebrews eleven six, And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. We must draw near to Him in faith. Curtis Vaughn in his commentary on James writes, Faith unlocks the divine storehouse. Oh, but unbelief bars its doors. It's closed to you, all the resources of God. Let's turn over to Matthew 15. One, another time Jesus highlighted faith in His ministry as he, as he gave good gifts, as He did good to others. Matthew 15 Verse 21, Matthew 15, verse 21, And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman, a Gentile from that region, came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. What came first? Great is your faith. This woman had to go through. She, had, she waited until Jesus came to her um, region. She found the Lord and cried out to Him. She, she had to endure the silence of Jesus. No answer at first. Then when she finally did hear something about her, it was the disciples saying, send her away, get her out of here, she's a nuisance. Jesus said, I'm sent only to the lost house of Israel. No, I'm not, not dealing with this Gentile woman. And then she finally comes before the Lord and pushes all that aside and says, Lord, I need some help, please. And then he says, well, I'm, I was sent to the house of Israel. I, I'm not going to throw the, the, the bread to the, to the dogs. And she pushes that aside and says, Lord... Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall. Just a little bit, Lord. Just a little bit. And her faith pushed her on and on and on to keep asking. The point is she didn't give up. And she got what she asked for from the Lord. We need to ask believing and not give up on our asking. And he said, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And that's the order. Great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Let us pray with faith. Not aimless, mindless, rambling before the Lord, but asking in, in faith. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This woman was not double-minded. She knew what she wanted. She wanted healing for her daughter from the Lord. And she pushed everything else aside and endured um, possible rejection to get a healing for her daughter. So she went to the Lord in great faith. And the Lord is pleased to grant it. And the Greek word here in, in James for double-minded, dipsukos, it means uncertain of the truth, doubting or hesitating. How rude it would be to go before a king and babble on not sure what you're trying to ask for. What a waste of your time and the king's time. The king would either say, get on with it, what, what do you want me to do for you? Or be gone from me. You're, you're uncertain about what you even want. I, there are plenty more behind you that I, that I must hear, that know what they want. We go before the Lord. Do we go believing, asking Him for wisdom? Our eyes fixed on that. Lord, I need wisdom. You are divine and have all divine wisdom. Grant me wisdom to know how to act in trials. We are to love the Lord your God with all your mind. Not to be double-minded. Half of our mind... Um, bent on following worldly wisdom, half of it trusting the Lord. To, tr to half trust the Lord is to dishonor Him. He wants all your mind, and He's worthy of all of it. The world is worthy of none of it. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all His ways. Why, why is such a person unstable in all their ways?
being double-minded. Well, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You're always going to be uncertain which master you're trying to serve. You can't have the world and God. You can't serve them both. You will hate one and you will love one. It's impossible to have two. Either you will follow the world and listen to what it says with its worldly wisdom, which may tell you to just put off trials or run from them or seek pleasures or whatever else the world's going to do. Or you will follow God and live by what He says, the wisdom that He teaches you from His Word. You will be constantly forced to, to hate one and love the other. And um, Elijah said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord is God, serve Him, and if Baal's God, serve Him. But quit with this Baal worship on one day and worship for the Lord on the next day. Serve one master. Pick one, serve him. It leads to instability in everything. No man can serve two masters. James will write later in uh, chapter 4, verse 4, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. No wonder there's doubting and hesitancy everywhere. Try, I'm, I'm, two masters are diametrically opposed to each other, and I'm trying to serve them both. No wonder there's doubting and hesitancy and unstab- instability there. No matter how much you try to live by the world's standards, it will never be enough for them. They want more and more or more of a different kind or a different quality, and then they change back to what they formerly wanted. And Jesus says, leave all that nonsense and folly. Come unto me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Put off this double-mindedness. This is the very person that, that needs wisdom. Someone who is asking the Lord in faith, don't want to be double-minded, Lord. I want to be unified, uh, serving one master, trying to serve two masters. Save me from trying to serve two masters. That foolishness. We need wisdom to live for God and forsake worldly wisdom. God, God has made worldly wisdom foolish. 1 Corinthians 1.20 If any of you lacks wisdom, writes James, let him ask of God. God has the supply of wisdom that you need. And he gives it generously to all without reproach. And it will be given him. But there's a caveat. You must ask in faith. Just like this woman that wanted a healing for her daughter. You must ask in faith with no doubting. For if you doubt God, you dishonor God. And in dishonoring God, we should not expect his blessings, his benefits. For he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Unstable like that wave of the sea. Restless, aimless. But if you know you lack wisdom, if any of you, James doesn't charge them and say, well, since I know all you lack wisdom. But we we, we know we all lack wisdom. This is a verse for us. It's not a verse for for some and not for others. Even the mature Christians, we... We need wisdom to have for navigating trials, for bringing honor and glory to God in the midst of trials. So go to God in faith, ask for wisdom. He's never withheld it from any authentic request, from any one that asked in faith for wisdom from God. It's what we need for everyday living, for trials. We need this wisdom from above. So avail yourselves, brothers and sisters, of the divine mind. Let's close in prayer. Our Father and our God, we we thank you for your word. We thank you for revealing your mind to us. We we do pray, Lord, for wisdom. We do acknowledge our need, our ignorance before you, that we need you to lead us and we need you to guide us. We need you to inform us. Inform these minds, Lord, that you've made by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the uh, power of your word. We pray that you would help us in the midst of trials, to to act wise, to not follow the world, to not follow our own uh, darkness of our minds, but that we would uh, follow after you, that we would have uh, this one thing before us, that we want to bring honor and glory to you in, in all things, in trials, and in our everyday life. So we pray, Lord, that you would grant grant us wisdom, grant us a faith, O oh Lord. We know that Faith comes from you as well. We need faith in in asking 
But Lord, help us, forgive us of our unbelief, Lord. Help our unbelief. We, we want to believe and to ask with, with faith that we might receive what we need to bring honor and glory to your name in this life. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.